There's a saying out there that if you give a million monkeys typewriters, that eventually one of them is going to turn out the works of Shakespeare. Now, on the surface, that might sound like a stupid saying. I mean, if you wanted some Shakespeare, you might as well just go down to the library or to the bookstore and get yourself a copy. But this saying is more of a statement about probability. Now, we've all had some probability in school. It's the study of predicting the outcome of something that is random. The simplest probability question is the coin toss. You throw a coin into the air and it's going to land on one side or the other. Now because it's random, you're equally likely to get heads or tails, but because it's random, you can't guarantee one or the other. And theoretically, this probability will scale up as well. If you throw a coin 10 times, chances are about half of those 10 throws you're going to get heads, and half of those throws you're going to get tails. Now, probability, of course, isn't a guarantee because it's a random event. So if you throw the coin 10 times, you might not necessarily get exactly five heads and exactly five tails, but chances are you're going to get something close, maybe a 4-6 split. But statistically, the more times you toss that coin, the more likely you are to approach the 50-50 split. If you throw the coin four times, there's a relatively big chance that you could get four heads or four tails. But if you throw the coin a thousand times, it's a lot less likely for you to get a thousand heads or a thousand tails. And one way to think about this is that the more tries you get, the more possibilities you open yourself up to. If you throw a coin once, well, you're guaranteed to only get one outcome, either heads or tails, and you're guaranteed to not get the other. If you throw the coin two times, you give yourself more chances to get both outcomes. But if you throw that coin a hundred times, you're almost guaranteed to get both outcomes. Now let's talk about that idea for a second. The more chances you give yourself, the more possibilities you open yourself up to. And let's talk about that in regards to streaks. If I gave you a coin and said, flip the coin, try to get heads, you may not necessarily get it in the first try, but the more tries you have, the more you open yourself up to the possibility of getting heads. So let's change up the game a little bit. Instead of flipping heads one time, let's say I asked you to flip heads three times in a row. Suddenly the three or four tries that you would have needed last time seem like not enough tries. The chances of you getting three heads in a row in only a few tries is highly unlikely. But like we said before, the more tries you give yourself, the more you open yourself up to the possibility of getting those three heads in a row. So you might not get three heads in a row your first three tries, but what if you flip the coin a thousand times? You think you can go on a hot streak of heads somewhere in that thousand? Probably. What if I gave you 10,000 tries? Well, after 10,000 coin tosses, you would actually be a little surprised if you didn't go on a three-head streak somewhere within that 10,000, right? It suddenly seems a lot weirder for you to not have succeeded in that 10,000, whereas with only three throws, it seems surprising if you did succeed. If you give yourself enough tries, something that seems unlikely to happen will eventually seem unlikely to not happen. What if I bumped it up to 10 tails in a row? Well, now even those thousand tries seem like not enough. A hot streak of 10 in a coin toss seems like a very tall order. But if I gave you enough throws, let's talk 2 billion throws? Well, you can be more confident that in that 2 billion, you're probably going to get a hot streak of 10. So the more complicated the streak you want to go on, the more tries you're probably going to have to take in order to get that outcome. If you just want to flip tails, you only need to throw the coin a couple of times before you get tails. But if you want a hot streak of three, well, you're going to be sitting here for a while. If you want a hot streak of ten, you're going to be sitting here for a long while. But if you give yourself enough tries, eventually you can kind of brute force your way into getting the outcome that you wanted. All you need is tries. So let's complicate the problem a little bit. A coin only has two outcomes, heads or tails, so let's talk about a dice roll. Now a normal die is six-sided, and you have the numbers one through six on each side. You roll the dice and you're going to get one of those numbers on top. And you'll find the same probability rules apply, just a little bit more complicated, given that you have more outcomes. If you want an outcome, let's say I want to roll a 3, the chances of me rolling a 3 on my first go is 1 in 6. But if I really wanted to go after that 3, all I need to do is give myself more chances. If I roll the dice a dozen times, chances are I'm going to run into a 3 somewhere within that dozen. Now if I wanted a more complicated combination, 
let's say a 1 and then a 3, well then a dozen tries seems like not enough. But if I roll it a hundred times, chances are somewhere within that hundred I'm going to roll a 1 and then a 3 right after it. The combination gets more complicated, I'll need more tries, but eventually I'm going to get it. If I wanted to roll a 5 and then a 1 and then a 3, well I'm going to be here a while, but it's not impossible. It just is going to take a lot of tries. And if we bump it up to a 5 and then a 1 and then a 3 and then a 1 and then a 1, well the same rules apply. You're going to need more tries than before, but eventually it's going to happen. So back to that saying about monkeys and typewriters. Now of course monkeys generally don't know how to use typewriters, so if you give them a typewriter, they're going to press random keys. And if you think of a typewriter or a keyboard as just a very complicated dice roll, you have 26 letters and a handful of punctuation, you might think of it as a dice with 30 or 40 sides on it, one for each letter and the handful of punctuation. And if the monkey is absolutely random in the way that it types things out, if you look at the works of Shakespeare as just a log of the outcomes of that dice roll, instead of thinking about a hot streak of 10 heads or 10 tails, or a number sequence to roll on a dice roll, if you think about the works of Shakespeare just like any of those other sequences that you can get off of a typewriter, well, the monkeys and typewriters is just another more complicated version of that coin toss, of that dice roll. It's much, much more complicated, but at the core, it's not that different. You just have a combination that is pages and pages long rather than a combination of five or six. So if you gave that monkey a typewriter, it's going to push random keys on it, and what you're probably going to get is a page of junk. The next page is probably going to be junk, and so on and so on. But just like that dice roll, if you wanted the monkey to type out an English word, let's say phone, well, it's going to first need to type a P, which has, instead of on that dice, a 1 in 6 of getting any number. The P is a 1 in 30 or 40, based on your typewriter. A 1 in 30 to 40 chance of that monkey typing a P. And then if it types that P, you have a 1 in 40 or so chance that it's going to type an H. After that, a 1 in 40 or so chance that it's going to type an O, and so on and so on, before it types that word. And if you just repeat that over the span of an entire work of Shakespeare, there is a very small but real probability that that monkey could type out a page out of The Tempest or Romeo and Juliet. And if there's a small but real chance that it could type out a page of Romeo and Juliet, then there's a real chance that it could type out a chapter of it. If there's a chance that it could type out a chapter, there's a real chance that it could type out the entire play. Now granted, it is a very small chance, but like we said before, even small chances, if you give it enough tries, will eventually become such a big chance that it seems unlikely that it wouldn't happen. If you give that monkey at that typewriter enough time, enough tries, enough pages, enough ink, eventually, at random, you would be rather surprised if it didn't type out a page out of Romeo and Juliet. Just like you'd be surprised if you didn't go on a hot streak of five tails in a row on a coin toss. If you flipped that coin 2,000 times, you'd be scratching your head if you didn't go on a hot streak of five somewhere within that thousand. The same thing goes for that monkey. If you keep that monkey at that typewriter long enough, you'd be rather surprised if it didn't type out the works of Shakespeare. And if you're looking to get more and more tries on that typewriter, instead of standing around and waiting for that one monkey, maybe you could get more monkeys. A million monkeys on a million typewriters can do what one monkey on one typewriter could do a million times faster. In the same way that if you wanted to flip heads on a coin, instead of sitting and flipping one coin a few times to try to get that, if you flipped a dozen coins all at once and just checked all of them just to make sure that did any of them land on heads, that's a much faster way to do it. And in the same way, if you had a million monkeys on a million typewriters, you're going to get those works of Shakespeare a lot faster than if you only waited on that one monkey to do it. And here's the thing. Remember how we said that the more tries you get, the more possibilities you open yourself up to? Well, the works of Shakespeare are only one possibility. Any and every book that has ever been written is another possibility that could have been typed out on those typewriters. 
So not only will you eventually get the works of Shakespeare typed out completely by random by monkeys on typewriters, eventually you're going to get Homer's Iliad as well. Eventually you're going to get Edgar Allan Poe. Eventually you will get Jurassic Park. Eventually you will get Harry Potter. Eventually you will get Twilight. Eventually you will get Dr. Seuss. Eventually you'll get Mark Twain. Eventually you'll get everything. Because if you give yourself enough tries, you will get every combination. And that's just how statistics works. So I want to do a thought experiment with you. And this thought experiment is especially for those who have experience in critique of literature. So all of you English majors, all of you English teachers, professors of literature, anyone who's done academic study of literature, I want to know what you would think if something like this happened. Imagine that tomorrow there's a book that's discovered, and people start translating it, and right from the beginning, before it's even completely translated, people are looking through it, getting it chapter by chapter, and already when they're just halfway through the translation, they understand that this is going to be one of those books that changes the world. It's going to be one of those revolutionary things that is going to be taught in schools forever. It's a book on the level of a Shakespeare, or a Homer, or a Tolstoy, or a Mark Twain, or an Edgar Allan Poe, something of that caliber. But here's the twisty flip side to that. If we're going to put together a list of books that change the world, yes, you're going to include the Iliad, yes, you're going to include Beowulf and Shakespeare, but you would also have to include books like The Communist Manifesto, wouldn't you? Now, it's not one of those books that, if we're going to compose a list of books that change the world, that we would normally think of being in the company of Shakespeare and Homer, but it would be incorrect to not be on a list of books that change the world. We're still living with the effects of that book on the world. Wouldn't it be factually incorrect to not include a book like Mein Kampf? Again, many of us are still living with the effects that that book had on the world. But it's not the kind of effect that we usually think of when we talk about the books that are going to be taught in school. But books like that also change the world. And this hypothetical book that I'm talking about, the one that's supposedly being discovered and translated, we don't know if it's going to be one of those good books that has a good effect on the world, or if it's one of those books that has an effect that most of us would rather forget. If it's going to save lives or take them. We just know that it's going to be big. And anyone who doesn't study it, who doesn't learn it, is going to be left behind. And those of you who have done literary criticism, one of the first things that you might look at is the author. Hard to understand a book without knowing the context that it comes from. Shakespeare makes a lot more sense if you understand the state of Britain that Shakespeare was living in. A little harder to understand something like the Iliad and the Odyssey from a modern perspective without understanding the Greek culture of the day. Edgar Allan Poe makes a lot more sense if you understood his life. Mark Twain makes sense in the political context of his day. Even the Communist Manifesto, you may or may not agree with it, but if you understood the political climate of the day, you can sit back after reading it and say, I may or may not agree with it, but I can see where that came from. I can understand the context of it. So needless to say, the author is a big part of understanding any book. So in this hypothetical situation, who's the author of this revolutionary book? What context did this book come from? What nation did this author come from? Did that have a political influence on what was written? Was the author male or female? Did that play into how the book was written? or the thoughts that went into it? What were their political beliefs? What were their spiritual beliefs? What was the culture of the day? Well, in this hypothetical situation, we don't know the author. It was written unknown. So all we have for a long time is just the book itself. To pour over, to scour, to obsess over, but we don't know who the author is. How would a book like that be studied? And how would it be taught? Well, let's say in this hypothetical that eventually the author of the book is found, and I imagine that this is going to be a big deal. After a long time of 
obsessing over this revolutionary book, this anonymous author would have made quite a name for themselves. So when it's finally discovered where this author lives, I imagine that the news reporters would come out, universities the world over would send their professors, send their scholars, there would be an army of grad students. So they all load up in their cars and in their vans. I assume there would be a news helicopter overhead reporting live from the house of the author of the revolutionary book. They knock on the door. A couple of news reporters smooth out their hair, try to find a comb, straighten out their jackets, try to look good for the famous writer of this revolutionary book. And when the door opens, they see an old man one who barely understands what they're saying. And they quickly come to realize that he's not quite right. The man can barely speak a cohesive sentence, but after enough motions and hand pointing, he kind of understands what they want to do. They want to come in and talk to him, even though he can't understand any of them. But he knows that they're interested in him for whatever reason. So he invites them in with some hand waving and some grunts, and people walk in, and immediately they notice at their feet a pile of papers that covers the entire floor. And they think, oh, this must be the musings of the genius that we're looking for. And they pick up some pages, they rifle through them, looking for more of the man's genius, and they find just junk. Not a cohesive word in the entire pile. Not a cohesive sentence in the entire mess. Well, hmm, that doesn't sound quite right, but maybe he was just testing out his typewriter, and this is where the garbage goes. Well, okay, so they brush it off, they follow him in, and they find more stacks of paper on end tables or chairs, and these are getting a little bit better. They're not entirely junk, but they're written to the level of a high school book report. Nothing special. Well, gee, that doesn't sound right. Where's the genius that we're expecting? But maybe those were his initial attempts when he was first starting to write. We all have that. So again, they brush it off, and they come into his office, and there's a little desk with a little typewriter on top of it, and some papers as well. And so as people start to prepare their microphones for the interview, get the lights just right, straighten out their tie... Some people look at the papers on his desk, they start reading through it, and yes, this is the genius they're looking for. The stuff on his desk is a gold mine. More of the things that they've come to expect from that revolutionary book. More thoughts that were just as good, just as interesting and rich. So yes, they know that this is the right place, so people get ready for the interview, they straighten out ties, get the lighting just right, get their clipboards ready with all the questions they want to ask, and completely ignoring them, the man climbs onto his stool and starts just mashing keys at random. And they all come to realize that this man wasn't a genius. He was a madman. And the only reason that he had a book that was so revolutionary, so genius, was because he got very, very lucky. It was written entirely at random. The book that they came to revere was written at random. How would we react to that? How would the news reporters say what they had found to everybody who was watching the evening news? How would we teach the background of this book knowing that the context of it wasn't political, wasn't social, wasn't anything other than probability? And I made up this hypothetical with a specific book in mind. Now, I use the term book loosely. It's not literal pages between two covers, but it is a container for information, just like a book. The book that I had in mind was the genome. Your genome. My genome. The DNA that explains who and what every living thing on this planet is. And I find it fascinating how much of genetic history is defined by random events. I find it interesting how such a complex and intricate system can be left to chance. Now, to understand how life came to be, we need to understand how life is. Once we understand how life works right now, we can reverse engineer 
how we go from nothing to what we are right now. Now in biology, there's something called the central dogma of biology. Central dogma because it's the core of how life works. There is not a living being on this planet, whether you are a person, a dog, a tree, a mushroom, or a bacteria, that doesn't do this. All life on this planet exists to do this. Now you start with DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It is a polymer, poly meaning many. So you can think of DNA as a chain of a bunch of different chain links. Each chain link has an identity. It has a different nitrogenous base. And in DNA, these are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And most people abbreviate them A, T, C, and G because adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine are kind of a mouthful. Now DNA is double-stranded, which means it's actually two chain links that are stuck together. And the reason they stick is because these nitrogenous bases, the A's, T's, C's, and G's, stick together. They stick together by hydrogen bonding, which individually is not very strong, but just like Velcro, if you get a bunch of them next to each other, it can stack up. And if you have the entire strand stuck together by hydrogen bonds, it adds up, and it's a strong bond that can keep the two strands together. But individually, hydrogen bonds aren't strong at all. And it's specific. For the most part, adenine will only stick to thymine, and guanine will only stick to cytosine. There are cases where different things can happen, but for the most part, A sticks to T and C sticks to G. Now, DNA can be used as a template to create RNA. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid, as opposed to deoxyribonucleic acid. The two molecules are very similar, and they act very similarly. RNA, just like DNA, is a chain link of ribonucleotides instead of DNA's deoxyribonucleotides. And they both have nitrogenous bases. The only difference is in RNA, instead of thymine, instead of T, you have uracil, which is abbreviated U. So in RNA, A sticks to U and U sticks to A. And this is taken advantage of. If you get a single strand of DNA, or you just unzip the double strands, you can get single chain links of RNA. And because U's will stick to A's, C's will stick to G's, G's will stick to C's, and A's will stick to DNA's T's, you can use that sticking to build RNA and copy what's on the DNA. So if your DNA strand reads AGGC, you can get an RNA strand that reads UCCG. And you can use this to build very long strands of RNA that are basically reverse copies, sort of like a photonegative, because they're the opposite of what the DNA says, but it carries the message of the DNA. And these RNA molecules are called mRNA, which stands for messenger RNA. And the process of building messenger RNA off the back of DNA is called transcription. It's transcribing a DNA message into an RNA form. Now the RNA message is taken and read. It's read by ribosomes, which take the mRNA message and translates it into a protein language. So ribosomes take strands of mRNA and match three-letter sections called codons to anticodons on a piece of tRNA or transfer RNA. And they match up exactly the way that DNA does. And the transfer RNAs transfer amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks to proteins. If you string a bunch of amino acids together, eventually you're going to get a protein. And the proteins are the things that actually do things in the cell. If you take in some sugar and you want to break it down for food, you're going to need a protein to do that. So that's the central dogma of biology. You have DNA. DNA is transcribed into an mRNA message. The mRNA message is translated into a protein language, and the proteins do stuff. So now that we know how life works now, how did we get here from nothing? How did we go from a glob of lava in space to a planet that has life on it? 
Well, unfortunately, nobody knows for sure. It's impossible to know. As a lot of people point out, nobody was there to know. So how can we know for sure? But if you don't know, you can make an educated guess. And science has some very good educated guesses. The best one so far is called the Yuri Miller experiment. Now, the Yuri Miller experiment tries to recreate the formation of life on the planet. At the time the experiment was carried out, scientists were fairly confident they knew what was on the planet before there was life. They had very good guesses as to what the composition of the oceans were before there was life. So whatever was in the oceans during that time gave rise to life. And they called this mixture primordial soup. So the Yuri Miller experiment took the best guess at what primordial soup was, how much salt there was, how much water, how much of each component, and tried to create the conditions of how Earth was during that time. So they mixed up their formula for primordial soup, and they put a heating mantle under it to simulate the geothermal heat that must have been coming from the Earth as the Earth cooled down. And they put electrodes over the primordial soup to simulate the lightning that might have hit the surface of the ocean, and they turned on the entire contraption, and in no time at all, they got the building blocks for life. They got sugars, they got nucleic acids, they got amino acids, they got phospholipids, everything that you would need to build a cell. They got everything that was needed for life in almost no time at all. Now, of course, this wasn't Genesis. They didn't have life in the flask, but they had everything they needed to build life. Now, it wasn't perfect. A lot of people had done calculations to figure out how much of each of these components you would need to optimally build a cell. And the Yuri Miller experiment was short on some ingredients and had too much of some of the other ones, but it was a proof of concept. The reason why the Yuri Miller experiment is so important is that it shows that the building blocks necessary for life can be reliably made on its own. And once you have the building blocks for life, you can start getting to work on building life. And it's generally agreed upon that this process is random and haphazard. Single monomeric molecules can polymerize with each other and make larger molecules, and then those can be broken back down back into the monomers and reused in another polymer. The basic mechanism is that these monomers will polymerize with each other, and the idea is that if they polymerize into something that works, then they'll be kept around, possibly replicated, and if they polymerize into something that doesn't work, into junk, then they are broken apart and reused for something that will work. So imagine primordial soup on a molecular level is a vortex of different molecules that constantly meet each other, bond together, or break apart. It's a random swirling mess. Author Terence Brown writes about this chaotic process in his book Genomes. He writes, quote, Polymerization of the building blocks into biomolecules might have occurred in the oceans or could have been promoted by the repeated condensations and drying of droplets of water in clouds. He cites Wozy in 1979. Alternatively, polymerization might have taken place on solid surfaces, perhaps making use of monomers immobilized in clay particles, he cites Wachterhauser in 1988, or in thermal vents, he cites Wachterhauser in 1992. The precise mechanism need not concern us. What is important is that it is possible to envisage purely geochemical processes that could lead to synthesis of polymeric biomolecules similar to the ones found in living systems. It is the next steps that we must worry about. We have to go from a random collection of biomolecules to an ordered assemblage that displays at least some of the biochemical properties that we associate with life. These steps have never been reproduced experimentally, and our ideas are therefore based mainly on speculation tempered by a certain amount of computer simulation. One problem is that the speculations are unconstrained because the global ocean could have contained as many as 10 to the 10th, that's 10 billion, biomolecules per liter, and we can allow a billion years for the necessary events to take place. This means that even the most improbable scenarios cannot be dismissed out of hand, and a way through the resulting maze has been difficult to find. End quote. Yuri and Miller proved that we can get the building blocks that we need based on what we had at the time, and we know how biology works now. But connecting the dots from A to B is the big mystery. And as Brown said, there are so many variables, there are so many unknowns, and so many different possibilities that it is going to be impossible to be absolutely sure of the exact mechanism of how life was started. 
But the general way that this story is told is that essentially you just have to stir the drink for a long enough time that you get what you need. Once you have the building blocks, all you have to do is let them react with each other, and eventually you're going to get a working biological system. And the assumption usually is that once you have a working genome, once you have something that can program for all of the proteins that you need, and it makes its way into a cell, and that cell isn't killed and is able to replicate, that the game is over. That all you're waiting for is a proper working genome and for it to be inside of a cell. And once that happens, it's game over, and life can start. But unfortunately, there's a problem with that story. We mentioned earlier that DNA needs proteins to do what the DNA says. Well, if you need DNA to make protein, and you need proteins to copy DNA and make more proteins, where do those proteins come from? It seems kind of like a chicken and an egg problem, doesn't it? Now, this chicken and egg problem is described by Terence A. Brown in his book, Genomes, where he says, quote, Progress was initially stalled by the apparent requirement that polynucleotides and polypeptides must work in harness in order to produce a self-reproducing biochemical system. This is because proteins are required to catalyze biochemical reactions, but cannot carry out their own self-replication. Polynucleotides can specify the synthesis of proteins and self-replicate, but it was thought that they could do neither without the aid of proteins. It appeared that the biochemical system would have to spring fully formed from the random collection of biomolecules because any intermediate stage could not be perpetuated, end quote. Now what Brown is saying is that it is a chicken and egg problem. If you need DNA to tell proteins how to make proteins, then the proteins can't make themselves. Where do the proteins come from? And if you need proteins to make DNA, then where did the DNA come from? And what are the chances that you had a working DNA strand by random, and you also had proteins that assembled into working proteins also at random? Like we said before, the more complicated the sequence, the longer it's going to take. And the idea of making both a working genome and working proteins at the same time at random, well, that's a tall order. And it starts looking like even billions of years doesn't look like enough time. So how did life even come to be if even billions of years isn't enough? How do you solve the cosmic chicken and egg problem? Well, Terence goes on to describe what is believed to have happened instead. Quote, The major breakthrough came in the mid-1980s when it was discovered that RNA can have catalytic activity. Those ribozymes that are known today carry out three types of biochemical reaction. 1. Self-cleavage, as displayed by the self-splicing group 1, 2, and 3 introns and some virus genomes. 2. Cleavage of other RNAs, as carried out by, for example, RNAs P. Synthesis of peptide bonds, by the rRNA component of the ribosome. In the test tube, synthetic RNA molecules have been shown to carry out other biologically relevant reactions, such as synthesis of ribonucleotides. He cites Unraun Bartle in 1998. Synthesis and copying of RNA molecules. He cites Eklund and Bartle in 1996 and Johnson et al. in 2001. And transfer of an RNA-bound amino acid to a second amino acid forming a dipeptide in a manner analogous to the role of tRNA in protein synthesis. He cites Losey and Jostak in 1996. The discovery of these catalytic properties solved the polynucleotide-polypeptide dilemma by showing that the first biochemical systems could have been centered entirely on RNA, he cites Bartle and Unrau in 1999. End quote. Checkmate. How do you solve the cosmic chicken and egg problem? You find one that can do both. RNA was similar enough to DNA that it could carry out the information side of things, but it could also do things that proteins could do. Which came first in the chicken and egg problem? Neither and both. But of course, life today isn't centered around RNA. It's centered around DNA and proteins. So if we start with RNA doing both roles, then somehow we're going to have to end with DNA and proteins taking over. There had to have been a transition or else we'd still be using RNA for both. So why did this happen? Brown says in his book, quote, 
How did the RNA world develop into the DNA world? The first major change was probably the development of protein enzymes, which supplemented and eventually replaced most of the catalytic activities of ribozymes. He cites Freeland et al. of 1999. There are several unanswered questions relating to this stage of biochemical evolution, including the reason why the transition from RNA to protein occurred in the first place. Originally, it was assumed that the 20 amino acids in polypeptides provided proteins with greater chemical variability than the four ribonucleotides in RNA, enabling protein enzymes to catalyze a broader range of biochemical reactions. But this explanation has become less attractive, as more and more ribozyme-catalyzed reactions have been demonstrated in the test tube. A more recent suggestion is that protein catalysis is more efficient because of the inherent flexibility of folded polypeptides compared with a greater rigidity of base-paired RNAs. He cites Sermoli of 1997. Alternatively, enclosure of RNA protogenomes within membrane vesicles could have promoted the evolution of the first proteins. Because RNA molecules are hydrophilic and must be given a hydrophobic coat, for instance, by attachment to peptide molecules before being able to pass through or become integrated into a membrane. He cites Walter et al. End quote. So the reason why RNA was subsequently replaced by DNA and proteins isn't known, but there are some good guesses. The consensus tends to be a question of usability. RNA as a catalyst and RNA as genetic material were adequate. It was doing the job it's just that DNA and proteins can do that job better. And the proposed reason why this is varies. Sermily proposes that proteins are more flexible and are able to do more things. And Walter et al. suggests that this might just be a chemical thing, that RNA needs other molecules and machinery to anchor it and take care of it, where DNA and proteins don't. So the exact reason isn't yet known, but it seems fairly certain that it's a question of usability. RNA could do the job, it's just DNA and proteins could do it better. And this is not to say that RNA has been completely phased out as a catalyst. There are still instances of what are called ribozymes. It's just that proteins form the backbone of work that's carried out by the cell. Now things start to get interesting when working genomes start entering the picture. When there is literally life on the line, the game changes a little bit. Now as we said before, the more tries you give yourself, the more you open yourself to getting new outcomes. And trying when there's no life on the line is not a big deal. You can keep re-rolling the dice, and not a whole lot happens in the global scheme of things. But once working genomes and life enters the picture, rolling the dice can be the difference between life and death. Once there are living organisms, those living organisms have a vested interest in keeping DNA the way it is. Because DNA the way it is, is what allows them to be alive, and any changes to that could kill them. Which introduces the problem of mutations. A mutation is defined as a permanent change to a nucleotide sequence in a genome. So anything that changes the combination and order of a genome permanently is a mutation. Now there are different ways to classify mutations. One way is to look at where the mutation came from. And the big split here is between exogenous and endogenous mutations. Exogenous meaning from outside of a body. Now exogenous mutations can be further broken down into how it acts on the DNA. Physical mutagens are things such as light or ionizing radiation that has a physical impact on DNA as a physical molecule. A chemical mutagen is any substance or chemical that has either a chemical reaction with the DNA and changes it chemically or influences the way that it functions. Now, chemical mutagens are probably the most obvious ones. Things like asbestos, alkylating agents, deaminating agents, chemicals that might have a reaction with your nucleotides, or even large aromatic molecules like intercalating dyes such as cyber green might intercalate into DNA and have no chemical reaction with DNA, but changes the way that it folds and functions. Even that can have a mutagen function. And last, biological mutagens, things like viruses. Viruses inject their own genetic material into a cell, and have mechanisms that will incorporate this foreign genetic material into a cell's genome. That will also permanently change a genome. Whereas before it didn't have a viral genome in it, well now it does. Viruses themselves are mutagens. 
Now another way to classify mutations are the material effect that they have. And the big divide here is the difference between point mutations and frame shift mutations. Now point mutations are probably the simplest to understand. It's just taking a nucleotide and changing it for something else. If you want to think about it in literary terms, take the word dog, D-O-G, and if you had a point mutation to the first letter, say it's changed from a D to an L, well suddenly dog becomes log. Now point mutations can be further broken down into a few different types. The first, least dangerous one is known as a silent mutation. Now you may change a base within the genome, but if you're lucky enough, that nucleotide change is not going to have a material effect on the protein that that gene produces. Now there are several reasons why this might happen. The mutation could occur in a non-coding region, a portion of the DNA that does not code for proteins. So if you make a change there, it won't have a significant change on how an organism operates, because all the proteins will still be there. Now another reason why a mutation might be silent is because of something known as the wobble effect. Now earlier we said that a amino acid is coded for by what's called a codon, which is three nucleotide bases in a row. So each combination of three nucleotides codes for an amino acid. But given that there are four bases, ATCG or AUGC in RNA, a combination of three will yield 64 different combinations. Now when you're coding genetically, there are 20 genetically relevant amino acids, and you'll also need to throw in a start and a stop command. So 64 different combinations that have to be distributed only over 22 different possibilities. So a lot of these codons are redundant. So if you make a point mutation, there's a real possibility that if you change a codon in such a way that it just becomes another one of those redundant codons, you could still code for the same thing. So you have a mutation within the genome that produces no material change in the proteins that you produce or any other function. It's kind of like a bullet dodged, isn't it? You can have a mutation occur, but through some means and methods and a little bit of luck, it might not affect you at all. If a point mutation, instead of being silent, does have an effect on the protein being produced, if you change the codon and it changes the amino acid that that codon codes for, you'll have a missense mutation. Now there are two different categories of missense mutations. There's conservative, which means the amino acid that you change to isn't that different from the amino acid that you change from. What was there before and what's there now is similar enough that the protein can function more or less normally. There are certain amino acids that are very similar chemically and very similar in function that if you swap one for the other, you might not necessarily get a big difference. And if there's no noticeable change, it's known as a conservative missense mutation. That does mean that the other category is the non-conservative where there is a noticeable change, where the amino acid that you change to is different enough that it's going to affect how the protein works. Depending on what you change to and change from, you could have anywhere from a protein that doesn't work as well to a protein that doesn't work at all. Now there is one other possibility if we're talking about point mutations, and that's the nonsense mutation. A missense mutation is where if you change a codon and it changes an amino acid codon to another amino acid codon, but if it changes it to a stop codon, well, the protein is going to be cut short. And chances are it's not going to function at all. And this is called a nonsense mutation. You change a amino acid codon to a stop codon where there shouldn't be one. The change in a nonsense mutation is almost always noticeable. So those are the three different kinds of point mutations. The other types of mutations are much more insidious. It's a frame shift mutation. Now in the process of translation, going from mRNA to protein, position is a very delicate thing. You have a start codon, and every three nucleotides after that codes for an amino acid. So it's very important that you stay on that reading frame. If you take out one or two bases, well, how many of you have misbubbled on a Scantron during a test? And because you missed one question, all of your answers were shifted up by one and they were all wrong? Well, imagine that happening inside of your body. That is, in essence, a frame shift mutation. Either you take out or you add some number of nucleotides, and it changes the entire reading frame. So instead of reading three of this codon, three of the next codon, three of the next codon, you might read 
the last two of the first codon and the next one of the next, and putting in whatever amino acid that codes for, then reading the next two and the one on the codon after it, and putting whatever that codes for. It messes up the reading frame of the mRNA. And just like when you miss bubble on a Scantron, all of the things that happen after that mistake is essentially random. You may get a few correct answers, but that's purely by luck, and you introduce enough wrong amino acids, the protein's not going to work correctly. So needless to say, mutations can be a big problem for a living organism. Yes, there's the chance that you might get a silent or a conservative missense mutation, which is about as good a scenario as anyone can hope. But realistically, if you're going to be alive, you need to be able to protect yourself against mutation, because there are mutations that are literally the difference between life and death. So the effect of a mutation can range anywhere from completely harmless to downright nasty. So it's in the best interest of a living organism not only to keep their genome the way it is, but also to have a way to fix the genome should a mutation occur. So for living organisms that we know of, there's several tools in the toolbox for fixing a mutation when they occur. Now earlier we talked about the genome as if it were a book, and a lot of these methods for fixing a genome can be analogous to patching up a damaged book. So one of the simplest repairs that can be made to the genome is something called direct reversal. These would be reversals of any of the physical or chemical alterations that are made to the genome. One of the more common chemical reactions that can damage DNA is the dimerization of pyrimidines. So your pyrimidines in DNA are cytosine and thymine, and in RNA are cytosine and uracil. So when there are two pyrimidines next to each other and they're hit with UV light, sometimes the UV light will rearrange the two double bonds into four single bonds and essentially fuse the two nitrogenous bases together. When the two nitrogenous bases are fused together, they can't operate the same way. So the DNA is damaged and the cell is going to need a way to fix it. So direct reversal is a term to describe the processes that undo any of the gross chemical or physical wear and tear of the DNA molecule. Physical wear and tear on a book can be a grab bag of different things, and the methods that you use to fix them is similarly varied. Direct reversal to fix damaged DNA is also varied and specific to the type of damage that you're talking about. Direct reversal only covers certain types of chemical and physical damage. So some of the most common things that DNA can run into are the different kinds of damage that ultraviolet light can cause. So there are methods to undo damage from ultraviolet light, but only the more common types of ultraviolet damage, such as pyrimidine dimers. If you're going to expose DNA to a less common kind of chemical damage or just something more exotic, the cell's not going to have tools in its tool belt to fix something like that. For example, if you expose DNA to a chemical like hydrogen peroxide, the peroxide is going to have so many different chemical reactions with the different parts of DNA that to expect the cell to have a different tool to fix each of the different possible damages that peroxide can do is unrealistic. The tool belt only covers very common types of damage. So there are limits to direct reversal. Now let's talk about point mutations. The book equivalent of a point mutation would be something like a typo. It's a small point change error that doesn't change the way things are read, the way that a frame shift mutation would change things, but it's still wrong nonetheless. So how would you go about fixing that in order to make it readable again? Well, the easiest way is just to re-add whatever was incorrect in the typo. The process of base excision repair is very similar. Essentially, you cut out of the DNA strand the base that was wrong, and you add back the base that's correct. So if you have a point mutation, say an adenosine that shouldn't be there, you can cut that adenosine out and add in whatever base that it should have been. But of course, there's the question of how do you know what to add? How do you know which nucleotide would be correct to add in the place of the wrong nucleotide? If you're fixing typos in a book, you can use context clues to help you along, and the story in DNA is pretty similar. You can use context clues to figure out what letter that should have been. For example, if you ran across a word where the first letter was a typo, but the last three letters were O-O-R, if the rest of the sentence talked about someone closing a whatever that word is, chances are the letter that was closed out was D because it makes sense for someone to be closing a door. And you can use context clues in DNA in the same way. Remember, we talked about the nucleotides being complementary to another nucleotide. 
G sticks to C and A sticks to T. So in base excision repair, you cut out or excise a base out of the DNA strand and replace it with the correct one. So if you excise a base and across from that base you have a G, you would know that the correct base to put in would be a C using your context clues. If there was a T across from the base you excised, then you would know to put an A in the empty space. And this might be all well and good once you have the base already excised. If you haven't excised it and you just see something that you know is wrong, say a G paired with an A, we know that guanosine doesn't generally base pair with adenosine. Well, how do we know which one is right and which one's wrong? There's a kind of case of he said, she said. Is the A correct and the G needs to be a T? Or is the G correct and the A needs to be a C? And even there, there is a level of context clues that you can use. DNA strands that are older tend to be more hemimethylated. When the cell makes a strand of DNA, it will constantly undergo hemimethylation as it ages. So a strand that is older will have more hemimethylation, and in a case of disagreement, the cell will tend to take the side of the older strand. There's a case of seniority there. Now this may not necessarily always be correct. An older strand can definitely be mutated, but the idea is that if the cell has been living with this strand for longer, that it must have been doing something right, and the newer strand is more untested. So it's much less risky to change a new strand than it is to change an old one. So you can use context clues to fix all sorts of small mistakes within a DNA strand, in the same way that you can use context clues to fix small mistakes within a book. The bigger the damage to the book or the DNA strand, though, the less context clues you have. You can definitely replace single letters or single words, maybe even a few words or sentences in a book using the context clues around it, and you can be fairly confident that it's right. In the same way, if the damage to DNA is very small, you can make repairs and be fairly confident of those repairs being correct. Now, if for some reason you had a book with a page missing, you probably can't use context clues to fix that and be fairly certain that all of that is correct. If the damage to DNA is a lot larger, methods such as base excision repair won't be enough to cover it. So if the worst should happen and you do have pages missing from a book, what's the best that you can do if you didn't have another copy, if you couldn't copy it from another source? Well, the best answer would be just to kind of fudge it and hope that it works. If, for example, the climactic pages of Romeo and Juliet were ripped out of your copy, and you couldn't go and find another copy to replace it, but you really wanted to fix this book, well, you, you're you kind of short on options. And the best that you can do is just to fudge it. You know that the last page before the damage has Juliet out cold and Romeo's looking for her, and you know that the first page after the damage has them both dead, spoilers by the way, and you kind of remember what happened in the middle, but you don't know exactly the words, so the best that you can do is just kind of make it up. You know that you have to go from point A to point B, and you know that it takes this many pages. So you just fill those pages with what you think might have happened, try to get it as close as you can, but essentially you're pulling things out of thin air and just hoping that it works. So Romeo's out doing something, and I don't know what happens next. Maybe there were some dragons involved. You write a few pages, you stick it in, hope it works, but ultimately you're unsure of what's right and what's wrong. You, there's no way to be sure. And as slipshod and scary as that sounds, that's a legitimate way to repair some of the more high-level damage that can happen to DNA. It's called low-fidelity repair, which basically means that you're repairing it without being sure if it's right. And essentially, it's just fudging it and hoping that it works. And Lauren Waters and her colleagues write about this in the Microbiology and Molecular Biology Reviews. She writes, quote, TLS, or translesion synthesis, is the process by which a DNA lesion is bypassed by the incorporation of a nucleotide opposite to the lesion. She cites Friedberg et al. 2005. Many DNA lesions cannot be used as a template by the highly stringent replicative DNA polymerases, which are optimized to replicate the entire genome with high accuracy and efficiency. She cites Baker and Bell in 1998 and Friedberg et al. 2005. However, a class of DNA polymerases with particular characteristics, termed TLS polymerases, can use damaged DNA as templates and insert nucleotides opposite lesions despite the conformational constraints that many modified bases may impose. 
She cites Friedberg et al. 2005, Goodman in 2002, Prakash, Johnson, and Prakash 2005. TLS polymerases are found in organisms throughout all three domains of life. Most TLS polymerases are members of the Y family of DNA polymerases. She cites Amori et al. 2001 a unique class of DNA polymerases with specialized structures optimized to allow replication on damaged DNA substrates and, in some cases, to promote mutagenic DNA synthesis, end quote. So these TLS polymerases are able to take damaged DNA and replicate them in such a way that the normal high-fidelity processes can't do because the DNA is too damaged to allow it. And these low-fidelity measures generally don't get them correct. As the name suggests, it's not faithful to the original correct template. And as Waters writes, a lot of these are able to promote and cause mutations in the way that they operate. There's no guarantee of success, and there's actually a very large chance of getting it wrong. As we said before, the more complicated the sequence, the lower your chances of getting it right on the first try. So you stand a very good chance of getting it wrong using this method. So why is it used? If there's such a huge chance of getting it wrong, and we see all the problems that can happen if you do get it wrong, why would the cell do this? Waters writes that if you are in a position where your DNA is so damaged that problems are going to arise no matter what, if you're able to repair your DNA even if the repair is itself shoddy, it might give you a shot at surviving. She writes, quote, why are the TLS polymerases that can actively cause mutagenesis so conserved throughout all domains of life? The risk to the cell of potential mutations and replication perturbation is presumably outweighed by the fact that TLS polymerases confer a measure of resistance to DNA-damaging agents. In general, the type of mutations created by TLS, i.e. base pair substitutions, are less detrimental to the integrity of the genome than translocations and other gross chemical rearrangements that can occur in the absence of TLS. Evidence exists to show that the use of TLS polymerases is not trivial. In mammals, TLS polymerases contribute significantly to lesion bypass, as it has been estimated that 50% of DNA damage tolerance events occur through TLS rather than the more error-free recombinational bypass pathways. She cites Ackman in 2004. End quote. So low-fidelity repair can be used to combat some of the bigger, more nasty mutations that can occur. She cites things like translocations, things that can rearrange entire sections of DNA. These things can be safeguarded against using low-fidelity repair. And especially if you're a bacteria, if any DNA that allows you to live is good DNA, TLS can be a very powerful tool in your toolbox. But not all of us are bacteria. For larger organisms, such as we humans, not only does the DNA have to be something that allows a cell to live, it has to be the same DNA as the rest of the organism. If one cell gets mutated and is different from the rest, that can still cause problems within the organism. The bacteria doesn't have a larger organism that it needs to be a part of, but cells, such as human cells, need to be a team player. And if you're part of a multicellular organism, the game kind of changes as far as the extent to which you can repair your DNA, be unsure of it, and still be part of the team. Bacteria get carte blanche to do whatever they want because they don't need to be part of a team, but our cells do. And it changes how our cells play the game. So in some ways that removes an option from our cells playbook, but in its place we do get a different option, even if it is a more morbid option. Weinerd Roos and Bernd Kaina write in Trends in Molecular Medicine, quote, Two cellular strategies have evolved for coping with DNA damage. One, DNA damage is repaired or tolerated. Or two, cells that harbor DNA damage are removed from the population by death. Non-repaired DNA damage often has harmful consequences that manifest as chromosomal changes, gene mutations, and malignant transformation, end quote. So in many organisms, if your DNA is corrupted to such a point that you can't go on, one viable strategy is to not go on, especially if you're not the only cell in that organism. In the body of a larger organism, such as a dog or a human or a deer, the death of a single cell is not something that the rest of the body really mourns over. So better that that cell gets removed than that wrong and damaged DNA 
gets spread to the rest of the body. So Roos and Kina said that if a cell's DNA is damaged, either it will repair it, try to tolerate it, or it will kill itself in order to preserve the rest of the organism. Cells in an organism work together to such an extent that they will kill themselves rather than drag down the rest of the organism in order to survive. What a team player. So it's kind of ironic that some cells are willing to kill themselves over mutations. Other cells are making mutations almost as if on purpose, certainly by design. Thomas Kunkel explains this in the Journal of Biological Chemistry in his article. He writes, quote, Interest in the fidelity of DNA copying mechanisms remains high because the balance between correct and incorrect DNA synthesis is relevant to a great deal of biology. High fidelity DNA synthesis is beneficial for maintaining genetic information over many generations and for avoiding mutations that can initiate and promote human diseases, such as cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. Low fidelity DNA synthesis is beneficial for the evolution of species, for generating diversity, leading to increased survival of viruses and microbes when subjected to changing environments, and for the development of a normal immune system, end quote. So what he's saying there is it's true that if you are able to replicate your DNA with a high fidelity, it is going to be very safe for the organism. You're going to be more able to survive, and you're less likely to get some of the bad things that can happen because of mutation. But he points out that mutations are a driving force for advancement. Remember we said that the more you roll the dice, the more possibilities you open yourself up to. So if you stop rolling the dice, if you only have high fidelity replication, you close yourself off to the possibility of being better, faster, stronger. And the more likely it is that something terrible can wipe you out. As dangerous as mutations are, they're the ultimate safe bet in a perverse sort of way. So you can think of mutation as a gentle roll of the dice rather than the utter chaos that can come from monkeys at a typewriter, where a monkey on a typewriter has the possibility of churning out something wonderful. It also has the possibility of turning out junk. And perhaps mutation can be thought of as editing. You're not throwing out the entire genome, starting from scratch and doing it by random. You're making one random change within it. So no doubt things like this are still random, but it's much gentler and safer in order to keep organisms that are already alive, alive. Mutations are the driving force for complexity, for advancement, and for new abilities. But a big thing to remember is that these edits these mutations are still random. It's still a gamble. A mutation by any other name is still a mutation. And again, some of them can be very nasty. But it's a dice roll. If you want to open yourself up to the ability to be more complex and not just be a single-celled bacteria, you need to roll the dice. The more tries you give yourself, the more possibilities you open yourself up to. But of course, for every time you roll the dice, it's a gamble. A completely random gamble to your genome is generally bad for the individual. There are many more ways to write junk than there are to write Shakespeare. So the gamble for any single person, any single individual for a mutation, you don't necessarily want a mutation in you. Mutations have a very good chance of hurting the individual. The odds are kind of loaded against you but you definitely want mutation to occur in a population because the more tools in your population's toolbox, the bigger the chance that they'll have the tool that's necessary if something bad happens. So Kunkel cites things like being able to survive viral infections, the ability to survive bacterial infections, and he cites that it's necessary to form a normal immune system. There are parts of the genome that are written in such a way that it is purposefully mutagenic. Your antibodies are an example of this. Antibodies are what your body uses to tag any foreign invaders. If a rogue bacteria makes it into your body, your immune system does not necessarily know how to distinguish a friendly cell from an enemy cell. And these antibodies are used to tag invaders and distinguish them from friendly cells. 
but in order to make these antibodies, you have to account for every single possibility of different invaders that could come into your body. And trying to program every single possibility into your genome would be a huge undertaking. It would be impossible to be able to write every single antibody that you may or may not need over the course of your life. So rather than writing every single possibility, there's a space called the variable region, and the DNA is coded in such a way that it is susceptible to mutations, to the point where that section can be thought of as random. And even though we may think of DNA in our body to be exact copies, those variable regions can vary as much as snowflakes do. And mutations are a huge part of what accounts for how we go from a simple single-celled organism floating around in primordial soup to something as complicated as you and I. There is an inherent randomness to how genetics works. Whether it be zones in the DNA that is purposefully written to be mutagenic, whether it be exogenous mutagens that come and change DNA, whether it be low fidelity repair, which makes up genetic material as it goes, whether it just be random error in the replication process, there is an inherent probabilistic factor in genetics. And as weird and crazy and interesting as that is, I keep having to remind myself that this is my story. This is your story. This is everybody's story. The code that dictates who you are on a genetic level has an element of randomness to it. How it became what it was was in large part due to randomness. And the question to ask is, do you trust your genetic destiny to a madman? Would you trust your lover's genetic destiny to a madman? Would you trust the genetic destiny of your child, of your best friend, of everyone you know? Is it worth it to trust their destiny to something so random, to a madman? And the rather spooky and unsatisfying answer is, you don't have a choice. That's the way your body works. That's the way everybody's body works. That is how every genome operates. You don't have a choice. But I suppose there is a silver lining to it. With the rise of genetic engineering as a field of study, there are so many more very talented minds entering into the arena of writing their own genetic code. There are so many more authors on this planet than there was before. And yet with the greatest minds in biology and in genetics working round the clock, none of them have created a species. So maybe your genome was written by a madman, but it was also written by the best-selling author on the planet. And I think there's some pride to be had in that, to have been a product of the bestseller, even if that author is random in the way they work. Thank you very much for watching. This was the first project that I've done of this scale, both in size and in complexity. A lot of time and sweat went into it, so I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, I'd love to hear from you. Of course, likes and subscribes would help me out, but I'd be most grateful for the comments, the feedback. Because not only is feedback the only way that I know what I'm doing is working or not, that kind of interaction sustains me and it's what keeps me going in a project like this. So even if you're just dropping by to say hi, I'd love to hear from you. And for those of you who are looking for more of this, I've already started researching and preparing for another program in this format. I'll post a video soon that is sort of a debrief on this project, and I'll go into my plans for the next one. So stay tuned for that, and again, thank you for coming with me on this adventure.